Hello dear friends, Christ is risen, Christ is risen indeed. Greetings from Mount Angel. You know, I check in with you every week as a reminder to you that the monks of Mount Angel are remembering you during these pandemic times in our thoughts and in our prayers. And uh, those that were following this last week, you know that I suggested that during these 50 days of the Easter season up until Pentecost, uh, we could at least use some of our visits during that time to meditate on the Exultat, that wonderful hymn that is sung at the Paschal Vigil. And I suggested that you get a copy of that text and follow along and that I comment on it. Um, it's, I, you know, last week I said uh, uh, the, the Exultet is poetry, it's music, and it's prayer. And you need all three of those to do theology at a deep level. And this is some of the deepest theology that the church has expressed in this prayer in this song and in this poem. We're doing it in pieces, uh, my little visits with you and my commentaries, because it would, it would be a very long visit indeed if I did the whole thing. Um, but last week uh, we, we heard sung uh, uh, the, the first part and I commented on it. And it's, it's just this, this, uh, this call to have the heavens rejoice, to have the whole earth rejoice, to have this church rejoice and the building rejoice. And then uh, what we're going to listen to today and what I'll try to comment on a little bit to help you with is uh, a shift in the prayer where uh, the deacon uh, or whoever is singing the prayer uh, says something that's familiar to us all, the dialogue of the Lord be with you and with your spirit Lift up your hearts, we lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. Um, we're familiar with that, of course, for, from every Mass. That's the dialogue uh, that opens the preface and the Eucharistic prayer. And this is a wonderful dialogue, because it, and, and it's wonderful to use in the Exultat, because it's sort of a clue to us that, oh, this is going to be a prayer of thanksgiving. And, and right after that, it is truly right and just that we give thanks. So that's going to be the pattern of prayer. That pattern is something we're familiar with from the prefaces of the Mass. But, oh, it goes a whole lot uh, in a lot of different directions here. So uh, I, I want you to listen to that part. We'll just do uh, the first part of it. Listen to that. And uh, then I'll be back and say some few words about it. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just, with ardent love of mind and heart and with devoted service of our voice to acclaim our God invisible, the Almighty Father, Jesus Christ our Lord, his Son, his only begotten, who for our sake paid Adam's debt to the Eternal Father, and pouring out his own dear blood, wiped clean the record of our ancient sinfulness. These, then, are the feasts of Passover, in which is slain the Lamb, the one true Lamb, whose blood anoints the doorposts of believers. This is the night when once you led our forebears, Israel's children, from slavery to Egypt, and made them pass dry shod through the Red Sea. This is the night 
that with a pillar of fire banish the darkness of sin. This is the night that even now throughout the world sets Christian believers apart from worldly vices and from the gloom of sin, leading them to grace and joining them to his holy ones. This is the night when Christ broke the prison bars of death and rose victorious from the underworld. There. Isn't that beautiful? Let me comment a little, and then maybe after the comment you want to roll it back and, and, and listen again. But it begins with, it is truly right and just. What is truly right and just? To give thanks to the Lord our God. So we're giving thanks for the Lord's resurrection. But the attitude that's expressed here is, is wonderful. It is truly right and just with ardent love of mind and heart and with devoted service of our voice to acclaim. That's a lot, huh? Um, ardent love of mind and heart, and then with the service of our voice, beautiful, to acclaim. That's what's truly right and just. We want to ourselves acclaim God for the resurrection, to acclaim our God invisible, the Almighty Father. Yeah, you know, one thing that's clear is God is invisible. But why do we mention that? Implicitly, we're drawing attention to the fact that, yes, God is invisible, but he has become visible in his incarnate Son, Jesus Christ. And by knowing the incarnate Son, we know and can acclaim the invisible God, the Almighty Father, and to acclaim also Jesus Christ, our Lord, His Son, His only begotten. Look at all the titles there for Jesus. Jesus is His name. You don't need to have faith to call the guy Jesus. Jesus is His name. But every other title there is the insight of faith. Christ, Lord, Son, Only Begotten, piling up our faith in Jesus. He's Christ. He's Jesus Christ, our Lord, His Son, His Only Begotten. So you see the rapport, as it were, between Jesus is, is ours somehow. He's Lord for us. But who's our Lord? The one who is the Father's Son, who is the Father's only begotten. Who? Jesus Christ, his son, he has only begotten. Who? And then we're going to say, you know, now we're going to define Jesus by what he's just done. And, and the whole rest of the poem is Jesus Christ, who did what? Listen to the first one. Who paid for our sake, who for our sake paid Adam's debt to the eternal father. Okay, death and resurrection are on our mind, but the insight here is that this reaches back all the way to Adam and undoes a, something that Adam ga gave us, which is the problem of original sin. And that's over now in Jesus Christ. He's a new Adam. And he, he paid that debt by pouring out his blood which is called here his own dear blood. I love that habit of the church that when we refer to the Lord's blood, so often we recall it, we call it his precious blood, his own dear blood. And with that blood, he wiped clean the record of our ancient sinfulness. It's referring back to Adam, all right, ancient sinfulness. But note that it calls it our ancient sinfulness. The whole human race is engaged here and is culpable here. 
And then it goes on, these then are the feasts of Passover in which is slain the lamb. Feasts of Passover. Why the plural? The, the poem is referring to all these days of the Triduum. This is inside it. It's referring to the, the, the liturgy of the Lord's Supper, to the liturgy the previous day of the Lord's death. It's referring ahead to the 50 days of Easter all the way to Pentecost. These are the feasts of Passover, the feasts of the Pasch. And, and what defines the feast of Passover? In which is slain the Lamb, the one true Lamb. Ah, so we're thinking back to the original Passover of the Jewish people in which a Lamb was slain. But now we're talking about, not back then, we're talking about Jesus Christ, who is the one true Lamb, whose blood anoints the doorposts of believers. You see the echo of the first Passover, when a, a literal lamb's blood was smeared on doorposts to save the Israelites from the destroying angel that was moving through Egypt. But no, now this true lamb's blood is, is, is anointing the doorposts of believers. How so? We, as baptized Christians, receive his precious blood. This is the night when once you led our forebearers, Israel's children, from slavery in Egypt and made them pass dry, throd, dry shod through the Red Sea. This is the night. This, you heard it repeated again and again. This is the night. Note that it doesn't say this was the night, like back in the past. No, this night in which we're praying at the Paschal Vigil, this is that same night. So all those nights from the past converge with this is the night and and the deacon is revealing what's going on here we're standing in darkness with little candles it's night that's clear what's it mean well this is the night when once we were led out from slavery in egypt and passed dry shod through the red sea here's another image from that old exodus story but it's now this is the night that with a pillar of that with a pillar of fire, banished the darkness of sin. A pillar of fire led Israel out through the desert so that they could move even at nighttime. They could see even at nighttime. The pillar of fire now is this Easter candle around which we're singing the praises. This is that same night back then when Israel was moving, we're moving now. And this is the night, get this one, it's going one night after another. This is the night that even now throughout the world sets Christian believers apart. So now that ancient Israelite image is applied to what's going on in churches throughout the world. This is referring to baptism above all, but to all of the baptized also gathered around this pillar of fire that is the, that, that is the Paschal candle. What happens in baptism? It sets believers apart from worldly vices and from the gloom of sin. Where do we get that image, sets apart? That's the other side of the Red Sea. The Egyptians are over here. We're set apart. We're safe. But Egyptians, Red Sea, the real Egypt is sin and death. The real set apart is life in Christ which shows itself as being set apart from worldly vices and from the gloom of sin. Darkness can, can be an image of sin, if you will, but in this night, there is this light uh, set apart, leading Christians to grace and joining them to the Holy Ones. And then again, the phrase, this is the night when Christ broke the prison bars of death and rose victorious from the underworld. Magnificent that all those previous nights of Israel's exodus are all met tonight in baptism and in Christians gathered throughout the world and remembering that in the night Jesus rose from the dead. 
We're not even halfway through it yet, but that's where I'm going to stop this time. But hold on to that phrase, dear friends. This is the night. Because there's a lot in our lives that we could say is night. We don't see. We don't understand. We're close to death, perhaps. We're always close to death in some sense of how fragile our life is. Life is difficult. That's not all it is, but it certainly is that. There is a way in which life is night. But for a Christian, any night, it can be said, this is the night when Christ breaks the prison bars of death and rises victorious from the underworld. Peace to you. Christ is risen. Risen indeed.